Let's open our Bibles here. Mark chapter number 3 this morning. Mark chapter number 3. And for the last few weeks, we have been answering some of the questions that you have had. And we spent some time talking about the rapture, the Lord coming back for his church. And a lot easier topic to talk about than the ones we have covered last week and will cover today. Last week we talked about tattoos and tried to see what does the scripture have to say or maybe some things that it does not specifically say. And a verse that's taken out of context there in Leviticus. But there are some principles that we could apply not just to tattoos, but really almost every area of our life. Not can we do certain things, because the Apostle Paul talked about all things being lawful, but should we do these things? Because all things are not expedient, all things do not edify. And so, answering some of those questions. And uh, this morning, I'm going to try to answer a couple of different questions. Uh, and these are things that have been coming up and, and kind of reoccurring questions from different places. And whether it's somebody that I talk to about salvation knocking a door, or whether it's a Christian who is maybe concerned. Uh, but first of all, one of the questions I'm going to try to answer is uh, about the unpardonable sin. What is the unpardonable sin? And, uh, what a, and then the next question is, what about the sin unto death? And uh, two very uh, sincere questions by different people that have come in wanting to know about these certain things. And so we'll spend some time here this morning trying to answer some of those questions and see what the Bible might have to say to shed some light on those topics. Mark chapter number 3, and let's begin reading in verse number 22. It tells us in the scribes which came down from Jerusalem. And so the Lord had been doing some great miracles. And especially as you read from Mark. Now on Wednesday nights in our Bible study, we're going verse by verse through the book of Mark. We've started doing that. And one of the things that we're seeing in Mark is it records for us and emphasizes what Jesus did. And over and over again, we find maybe not a whole lot of information about these stories, but it's, it's amazing to me, especially in the first couple of chapters that we've got through, how many times it talks about him casting out demons and uh, delivering people from that bondage. And he does again here in Mark chapter number 3. And so uh, kind of set the stage for these scribes who are coming down from Jerusalem. And notice what they say. He, speaking of Jesus, hath Beelzebub... And by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And so we answer the question here, and we, we looked and we'll spend most of our time in Matthew, since we are going to cover this uh, portion of scripture on Wednesday nights in the book of Mark, but wanted you to kind of see uh, and set the stage for what they're talking about. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ had been delivering people who were in bondage uh, to spiritual wickedness, and so he was casting out these demons. And you notice the parable that he gives. You know, you cannot go into a strong man's house unless first you bind up the strong man. Uh, you know, we've got some big, tough, strong guys. You know, whether it's Randy or my brother, if I'm going to go into their house. And, you know, we had a teenager joke about breaking into Dwayne's house the other, a couple weeks ago, months ago. You're not going to break into one of these guys' house unless first you tie them up or some incapacitate them somehow. 
And uh, that's exactly what Jesus was doing. When he came into this world to deliver people, he was uh, loosening the stronghold. And so he talks about these different things. Uh, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. And Lord, we're thankful for those who have given their lives to teach and preach and proclaim the truth that well, we see here in Scripture. Lord, that, uh, that song, what a wonderful reminder. And I pray that you'd help each of us uh, to carry the gospel to those who uh, haven't heard, those that who do not know. Lord, as we spend some time looking into your word, asking, a- answering some of these questions, I pray that you would open up your truth to us that we might know how we are to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, you've told us that if we lack wisdom, that we can ask you and you will give it to us very liberally, very freely. And so, Lord, we pray that you give us wisdom as we spend some time in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's turn over back to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. Now, as I mentioned... Mark kind of emphasizes what Jesus did. And so uh, in a lot of his record, he doesn't give us the whole speech and teaching as Matthew does. Uh, Matthew uh, would have been very good at shorthand and writing down and taking notes on some of these things and recording more of the conversation and things that were going on. And so He gives us some of these great messages that Mark does not record for us. And in Matthew chapter number 12, uh, we spent some time reading down through here. And we won't take time to do that again. They accused Jesus of uh, casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. And uh, so he goes into this kind of answer in response to what they're saying. And beginning in verse number 25 of Matthew 12, he talks about a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And so he asks the question, you know, if if Satan is casting out Satan, then obviously his kingdom cannot stand. It will come to an end, he told us. And he gives us the story there about the strong man. And uh, you notice verse number 30, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And so he, he paints the fact that there are very clear lines. That if you are not with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are against him. You know, sometimes we hear people say that and use that phrase. This is where it comes from. And so it's very clear here that the people who are accusing him are not with the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not believe him. They do not follow him. They were his enemies. And uh, so he talks about the fact that if you're not helping me, if you're not gathering in, which is exactly what Jesus was trying to do, he said, man, I I would love to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks. He says, if you're not gathering together with me, then you're scattering abroad. And uh, what what a warning for God's people today. That if you are not doing the work that Jesus has commanded you to do, If I'm not going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, gathering in, he says, we're doing more harm than we are good. We're scattering abroad instead of bringing in. And we've been talking about that a little bit on Sunday mornings in my life group. But uh, he goes on and he says, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And so uh, there have been those that have kind of coined the term the unpardonable sin. The sin that cannot be forgiven, he says, neither in this world or in the world to come, that it cannot be forgiven. And so uh, I've had people come and ask me the question. I've been knocking on doors and trying to witness to people and 
well, I can't be saved because I committed the unpardonable sin. And so you try to ask them the question, well, what is the unpardonable sin? And they'll go on and talk about all kinds of different things that have nothing to do with the unpardonable sin at all. And uh, so as we look at these different questions about the unpardonable sin, there's some things that we need to take note of, first of all, is he talks about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And uh, whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost. And he differentiates between this speaking against the Holy Ghost and blaspheming the Holy Ghost and speaking against Christ and blaspheming Jesus. There's a difference there between the two. Because he says in verse number 32, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. And uh, we hold high the Lord Jesus Christ. We respect and reverence his name as we ought to. He is our Lord and Savior. But he says, if you speak against me, you take my name in vain. You speak some word or blaspheme against me. He says, it will be forgiven you. And uh, you think about even Jesus as he suffered and died on the cross. People are mocking him as he's shedding his blood, giving his life, paying for their sins. You remember what he prayed. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, the wonderful forgiveness. And so as I stop to think about, well, what is the difference between Jesus and the Holy Spirit? Because if you speak against Jesus and blaspheme against Jesus, it can be forgiven you. But he says if you speak and blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it cannot be forgiven you. And so I want to know, what is the distinction? Is this just maybe using the Holy Ghost name in vain? What is it he's talking about? And so to understand it, as he makes a clear difference between the two... What is the difference? Because it's what the difference is that tells me what the unpardonable sin is really all about. And so we, we spent some time this past year on Wednesday nights uh, talking about God and, and com- the Holy Spirit, studying Him. And one of the things we noticed in studying the Holy Spirit is that we learn a lot about the three different persons of the Godhead. And they have a lot in common. And they do a lot of the same things. We kind of want to compartmentalize them. And Jesus does this, and God does this, and the Holy Spirit does this. But really, they do almost everything the same. They are all an active part in a lot of what goes on in our life. From creation on. And so... It's where the difference is that makes the difference. And so as we stop and think about some of these things about the Holy Spirit, let's turn over to John chapter number 16. John chapter number 16. And uh, here for a couple of chapters, the Lord Jesus Christ has been talking about the fact that he was going to leave his disciples. We have that great passage in John chapter number 14 where he tells them, Hey, don't be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come back and receive you unto myself. And, of course, Thomas asked the question, Lord, we we don't know where you're going, and and tell us how to get there. And so Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so he's letting them know, I am going to leave you, but that's good. It's beneficial. There are some blessings and some benefits of me leaving you. And he's continuing with that thought process here in John chapter number 16. Let's uh, begin in verse number 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it, ex- it is expedient for you that I go away. And so he's continuing on with this idea that it is beneficial for you. It is going to be a good thing. Now, normally we don't think of that as a good thing. You know, someone that we love and care about, they're going to leave us. We don't look at that as some great thing. They loved Jesus. They'd spent a lot of time with him. And uh, they'd left everything to follow Jesus. And now he's leaving them. 
He says, but it's a good thing. It's expedient. He says, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now notice this. And when he is come, talking about the Holy Spirit, the comforter, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and he's seen him, me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so here he talks about the fact that if I leave you, it's beneficial for you. Because the comforter, the spirit of truth is going to come. And he kind of lays out his responsibility here and in some other places about one of the main jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin and our need for a Savior. That we need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need somebody who can wash our sins away. And he says the Spirit's going to come and he's going to convict you of your sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's one of his main roles and responsibilities for those that do not know Christ as their Savior. And that's the real big difference about what the Holy Spirit and Jesus do. And so when he talks about some sin that we might commit, it's taking the work of the Holy Spirit and denying. The Holy Spirit had been working, doing these great miracles. It was obvious that something real and genuine was taking place. And they said, no, it's, it's, it's not God. It's not his spirit. It's devils. He's casting out devils. He's denying the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Bible talks about that Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. But you cannot call on him unless he calls on you. Unless he draws you to Christ, you cannot come to Christ. And that is the job of the Holy Spirit of God, is to convict us of our sin and draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ and to our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I shun and I deny that work of the Holy Spirit of God, I reject that work. That is a sin that cannot be forgiven. He says, either in this world or the world to come. And it's about what's going on in their hearts. And he says, and we like to quote that phrase, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He's talking about what they said. When they said, he's not doing it by the work of God or his spirit, he's doing it by the work of the devil. The Lord said, hey, if you're not with me, you're my enemy. And he understood what was going on in their heart. The Bible tells us that he knew their thoughts, verse number 25. He knew their thoughts. He knew their heart and what was going on. The fact that they did not believe. They had rejected the work that God was trying to do. And so here we find that if we reject the Spirit's work, he cannot be forgiven. That's why he says, call on the Lord while he may be found. To come to him while he's near. Don't put it off. Don't reject. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior, he is calling out to you. Do not reject the work that he's trying to do in your heart and life. Because there may come a day where he says, that's the last time I'm going to call you. He says, my spirit will not always strive with man. Think about Pharaoh in Egypt and that whole situation with Moses. He made his choice. Pharaoh made his choice. He chose not to believe in the one true God. Instead, he chose the God of Egypt. 
God sealed that decision. It talks about God hardened his heart. He sealed the decision that Pharaoh made. And today might be the day that will be the last time God allows you to reject his work and his call in your heart and life. So put your faith and trust in him today. And so I believe that only somebody who does not know Christ as their Savior can commit what is coined the unpardonable sin. With those words that Jesus said, if you are not with me, then you are against me. Only those that are against him can commit this sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit's work. And so what about Christians? Is there something that a Christian could possibly do? That is another matter. Turn with me to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. And I've had some people kind of ask me, about the, the sin unto death. And what does that entail? And there's a couple of things that uh, I point out to people who are genuinely concerned about either of these things. If you're nervous or worried and are fretting about whether or not you've committed the unpardonable sin or maybe about to commit the sin unto death, most likely you have not. Because the Spirit is still working in your heart and your life. Um, but here, 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 10, says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so he's talking about those that put their faith and trust in him, and uh, that you're going to have eternal life. And he says, verse number 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him. Now the we there is talking about those that have put their faith and trust in Christ. That we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hear us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so we talk, he's talking about prayer here. And he's going to be talking about something specific. That if we know Christ is our Savior and we pray according to his will, he's going to hear us. He's going to answer our prayers. And he says, verse number 15... If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And uh, there's a lot of debate about these verses. And uh, the important thing is to spend some time looking Throughout the scripture, we cannot just take one verse or a couple of verses and build a whole doctrine and theology on it. We cannot ignore what the scripture says about forgiveness of sin and just focus in on one verse. And so it's important for us to keep that in mind as we uh, spend some time looking into this. And I would encourage you to study these things out for yourself. You shouldn't ever just blindly believe anything that I say or anyone else says. Spend some time studying it, but he's talking about Christians here and their prayer life. And he says, if a man see his brother, talking about Christian here, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And uh, we, probably everybody in here knows somebody who's done some, made some choice that might put their life in jeopardy. Because of a way they've chosen to live their life. Um, you know, working with young people, you spend your time trying to warn them and about the different dangers that uh, decisions might uh, bring them to, the consequences of sin and of choices. And 
uh, you know, I have had the unfortunate privilege of being a witness uh, to some horrible things happen because of choices and decisions that we have made. And uh, as I spend some time looking throughout Scripture and trying to take these verses in light of what the Scripture has to say here, it seems that one of the things he's pointing to here is, of course, not a loss of salvation because once we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are sealed. We cannot lose our salvation. Uh, John chapter number uh, 8 or 10, I forget off the top of my head. I'd have to spend some time looking that up real quick. talks about the fact that if we know Christ is our Savior, we're in God's hand. And we are in the Lord Jesus Christ's hand, that we are sealed and we are sure that we cannot lose our salvation. So we know that he's not talking about someone that might do something to lose their salvation. And that's one of the things that I believe that somebody who knows Christ as their Savior cannot commit the unpardonable sin that we've talked about already because God has given eternal life. We even re read that in verse number 11 here, uh, that God hath given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. And uh, so uh, maybe he's talking about, uh, and I believe that it is more applying to physical life and death that because of a way that we might choose to live our life that God might bring us home I think of people that I've known that have cho chosen to live their life the way they wanted to I believe they knew Christ as their Savior and uh, their conversion was real their faith was real but they chose to wander off like the prodigal son and many of us know people like that. We pray that God would get their attention. That yeah. God would bring them back around. And uh, it's a wonderful prayer to make. And if you know somebody like that, whether it's a son, a spouse, a child, a parent, whatever it is, a friend, you ought to pray that God would get their attention. But uh, there are certain instances where God might not answer that prayer. Where in this life, God might not bring them back around. But instead, he might just choose to take them home to heaven. I think of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 that records for us that there were people, there were Christians who God chose to bring about to death because of their actions. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, um, we find that uh, he is dealing with an issue there in the Corinthian church on a matter of the Lord's table. They were not observing it correctly. And, of course, this being a picture of his sacrifice for us and his relationship, it, he holds it in high esteem. Uh, just ask Moses what happens when you destroy a picture that God is trying to paint. But uh, he says, verse uh, well, let's, let's look at uh, verse 23. We'll kind of read down through here and, and set the stage for you. He says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And uh, so he, he kind of lays out the Lord's table there and what we're supposed to do. Jesus set the example. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So he's talking to Christians here, this church, and he says there were those that... They have observed the Lord's table incorrectly. They did not come at it with the proper respect and reverence and approach that it deserves. This is not just some ritual that we kind of just go through the motions. This is a very serious thing here. And he says, we ought to examine ourselves and see, are we right with the Lord? Do we have a proper relationship with him? Is there sin in our life? He says, verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and notice this, and many sleep. That there were those that God killed because of their attitude towards his table. It was a serious thing. And we ought to take it serious when we come before the Lord. Not in just this matter, in, in our walk with him. He's bought us. We are not our own as we looked at last week. Therefore, we're to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's. We represent him in this world. We are a living picture of Jesus Christ in this world. And if we choose to misrepresent him, we are scattering abroad. He says there's going to be times where rather than allow someone to continue to tear apart the picture that he's trying to paint. And he will take them to heaven. And I've had the unfortunate opportunity to watch that happen. Where somebody that I believe really knew Christ as their Savior made a series of choices to walk away from the Lord. And I believe God took them home. Think of Ananias and Sapphira who come in. They made a choice. So God took them home. And so as we talk about this sin unto death, you know, if somebody's really concerned and worried, could I, could I commit this sin unto death? I would say you're probably not in danger of it if you're worried about it. Because you have a heart to do what's right. You have a heart. The Lord is working in you. But if you are living a life with known sin, listen, God must judge sin. He is a holy God. Yes, he is loving. Yes, he is forgiven. But we cannot ignore the fact that God is holy and he is just. And a holy God must judge sin. He must correct it, whether it's in my life or your life or anybody else's life. And so if we're going to just knowingly allow sin, if we're going to choose to not do things God's way, and instead I'm going to go my own way, do my own thing, those are dangerous steps that we're taking. Because we've been bought with a price. So I'm not my own anymore. I belong to him. And so whatever God wants to do with me, he has the right to do. So if I decide, hey, I'm going to go my own way and do my own thing, God may allow me to do that, but he may say, hey, you're coming on home. It's time to answer for what you're doing. And so I hope that this will be a help and a benefit to you. More than anything, I hope that it will help you to study these things out for yourself. To see, what does the Bible say about the unpardonable sin? What does he say about a sin unto death? These are things where there's a lot of debate and discussion. So don't just take what I've said and believe it. You go spend some time looking into God's word for yourself as we answer some of these questions.